All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are about to watch the lecture for Ralston Valley High School Chemistry, AP Chemistry, Chapter 7, Lecture 3, a discussion of spectroscopy. We've been recently having a lot of discussions around modern atomic theory, and we're going to take a little bit of a break from that to discuss spectroscopy. But as you'll soon realize, uh, spectroscopy and modern atomic theory are fundamentally linked to one another. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. When you hear the term spectroscopy, probably the first thing that comes to mind is the emission spectral lab, which we completed last year, that allowed us to look at those uh, spectral fingerprints of the different elements um, in gas emission tubes. Uh, as it turns out, spectroscopy is a much, much broader tool that we use in science that allows us to probe everything from the very, very minute, small-scale atomic world all the way up to the grandest scale of the universe in the world of astronomy and cosmology. Uh, spectroscopy really is a way of exploring the universe by looking at light and how that light interacts with matter. Uh, so what we're going to be uh, kind of talking about here today is how we can use light in different ways and different types of light to gain an understanding about different properties of matter that will allow us to understand what's going on on the internal scale of atoms. Uh, so quick definition here, uh, spectroscopy, we define that as a means of examining the physical properties of matter through its interactions with various frequencies and wavelengths of light. Because different wavelengths of light possess different energies, uh, as is described by Planck's equation, uh, those different frequencies of light or wavelengths of light interact with matter in different ways uh, based upon the different uh, energies that they possess. And we're going to start by talking about a couple of the different uh, kind of broad categories of spectroscopy which we use to probe matter. So one of the things that the AP test is interested in you understanding is how we can use different energies or frequencies slash wavelengths of light uh, to probe what's going on in the inside of atoms. And uh, we're going to be talking briefly here about uh, various different categories of spectroscopy, uh, basically various different frequencies or wavelengths of light that we can use, and what each of those different frequencies slash wavelengths tells us about the internal structure of atoms. The first of these types of spectroscopy we're going to discuss here is referred to as visible light spectroscopy, which not surprisingly uses visible light, that's the Roy G. Biv portion of the spectrum, in order to uh, primarily tell us about concentrations of solutions. Uh, this might sound like a familiar idea to you if you think back to the quantitative equilibrium lab from last year in which you determined the concentration of a solution of the thiocyanato iron 3 complex ion by comparing the depth of color. Uh, that was the lab we did, we called the colorimetry lab last year. Uh, the key idea here is kind of like the Kool-Aid idea, that is, the more concentrated the ion in solution, the more likely it is that light passing through it will get absorbed as it uh, strikes those molecules in solution. So again, that's visible light spectroscopy, uh, essentially the Kool-Aid idea of the quantitative equilibrium lab from last year. The second type of spectroscopy we're going to discuss here involves what we refer to as infrared spectroscopy that uses infrared light that is longer wavelength and lower energy than visible light spectroscopy. Uh, as it turns out, uh, infrared uh, radiation is primarily absorbed by uh, atoms and it excites the vibrational modes of uh, motion of those atoms about their bonds. And because of that, understanding uh, how infrared light is absorbed yields information about the bonding structure of molecules. Uh, it can tell us how the bonds are stretching, it can tell us how the bonds are bending, and it can also tell us what atoms are involved in the chemical bonds within a molecule. So this is a very, very useful tool for understanding what's going on in terms of bonding structure of molecules. So that is, again, infrared spectroscopy. Uh, it tells us about bonding structure of molecules by exciting vibrational modes of motion of those atoms about their bonds. Mm. So the next wavelength we're going to move along here to is the one you're most likely to come across when you're taking your AP test. Uh, this is what we refer to as either X-ray spectroscopy or UV spectroscopy. 
Um, collectively, both of these types of spectroscopy are generally used to uh, probe for information about the energy levels of electrons in atoms via a process we call photoelectron spectroscopy, or abbreviated PES. Uh, we're going to be investigating how to read one of these uh, photoelectron spectroscopy graphs, um, because that's the most common type of question which you'll come across um, on the AP test. But again, both of these types of uh, spectroscopy are used to measure energy levels of electrons and atoms. Generally, X-ray spectroscopy, being higher energy, is used to uh, eject core electrons from atoms, whereas the lower energy ultraviolet spectroscopy is generally used to excite or to eject valence shell electrons. And uh, one last type of spectroscopy I'd like you to be familiar with is what we refer to as microwave spectroscopy. Uh, generally, microwave spectroscopy can be used to gain information about uh, essentially rotational states of uh, molecules because when some molecules absorb microwaves, it causes them to rotate. Uh, this is the same process that your microwave uses in your kitchen. Uh, the water molecules, when they absorb microwave radiation, uh, have rotational modes of motion excited. And the water molecules, as they spin, produce frictional heating, which then causes uh, your food to warm up in the microwave. Uh, so, yeah, that's our uh, four main types of spectroscopy I'd like you to be familiar with. And on our next slide, we're going to move on to looking at how we can use photoelectron spectroscopy to gain insight into energy levels of electrons in atoms. So what we have here is a discussion out of photoelectron spectroscopy. And to get started with this idea, I'd like you to take you back to the discussion we had in Modern Atomic Theory about the photoelectric effect discovered by Albert Einstein. Uh, recall that when you shine light at the surface of a metal that it can actually eject electrons as long as the light which is being shown on the surface has a sufficiently high enough energy to cause the ejection of that electrons. And below that threshold energy level, uh, if we don't exceed the binding energy of those electrons, uh, none of those electrons get ejected. So that's kind of a, the basic idea behind photoelectron spectroscopy. If we take a incident photon of known energy and we shine that at a sample of matter, uh, the electrons in that sample of matter can absorb those photons, and depending upon the relative energy levels of those electrons, uh, we will see electrons ejected from the substance with different kinetic energies. And so what I'd like you to have a look at here is the diagram we have over on the right-hand side of our page here. Um, what you see there is a series of photons, all of the same incident energy, that is, we're using the same frequency of light for all these different uh, photons represented in this diagram. Uh, but, but depending upon which of the electrons absorbs that photon of light, we see electrons ejected with a variety of different kinetic energies. And so when you measure the kinetic energies of those electrons that are ejected, essentially measuring their velocities, we see that those kinetic energies of the ejected electrons are quantized. And we only see certain allowed energy states of the electrons which are ejected. Those correlate to the specific allowed binding energies of the electrons within the atom. If the electron is very, very tightly bound to the nucleus, it's going to take a lot of energy to remove that electron from the atom. And correspondingly, that electron would therefore leave the atom with a very, very low kinetic energy in comparison to a loosely bound electron a long ways away from the nucleus, which would not require a whole lot of energy to be ejected. And therefore, when it is ejected, a small amount of energy will go to ejecting that electron, overcoming the binding energy. And most of that energy then shows up as kinetic energy of the ejected electron. So essentially, by measuring those quantized energies of the ejected electrons from the surface, we can figure out what the binding energies of the electrons in the substance must have been. So big kind of key idea here is really what we're exploring is essentially an application of the law of conservation of energy. That is the sum of the binding energy of the electron and the kinetic energy of that electron after it's ejected must always be equal to the energy of the incident photon, which caused the ejection. 
And that's how we measure essentially ionization energies or binding energies of those electrons. So moving along here, uh, what we have next for you is an example problem that's probably uh, been in the last couple of years of AP testing the most popular type of question that they've asked related to photoelectron spectroscopy. Uh, what they've given you here is a uh, spectrum for a particular element, in this case neon, and they're going to ask you to make some uh, predictions about what each of those peaks in that spectrum correspond to in terms of the different energy level electrons present in the neon atom. And if you have a look there, you see on our scale, uh, we've got a binding energy along that uh, horizontal scale there, which ranges from 0 up to 1600 plus uh, times 10 to the negative 19th joules uh, for the energy levels of those different electrons there. And you'll notice that there's a big break in the middle where we see a big jump in terms of the binding energy of those electrons. So this question is asking us to give the principal quantum number n and the azimuthal quantum number l for the electrons that correspond to each of those peaks in the simplified PES diagram for neon there. So let's go ahead and do some logical thinking. Uh, for the uh, electrons represented by the peak to the furthest right on this spectrum, the first thing I want you to note there is that those electrons have the highest binding energy present of electrons in this photoelectron spectrum. So if we go ahead and start by looking at the electron configuration for neon, uh, neon is element number 10 on the periodic table, and following our Aufbau sequence, that gives us an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Uh, if we think about the electrons with the highest binding energy, those are not the highest energy electrons in the atom. Uh, that would be the valence shell. Those are the electrons which take the most amount of energy to remove from the atom. That is the electrons with the highest binding energy, the most tightly bound electrons. And therefore, those electrons at around 1400 times 10 to the negative 19th joules must be the innermost core electrons, those 1s2 electrons present in our neon atom. And as we recognize that those must therefore be the 1s2 electrons, that gives us a principal quantum number n of 1 and the azimuthal quantum number of 0 for those particular electrons. And now moving to the central peak right there, um, that central peak there must therefore be the electrons which are next closest to the core, uh, the next largest binding energy of what looks like around 65 times 10 to the of 19th joules there. Uh, those would now be valence shell electrons uh, in the second energy shell. So we've got a principal quantum number of two, and that would therefore be the 2s electrons at the next highest binding energy. And then all the way on the left-hand side there, our electrons with the smallest binding energy of only around 23 or 24, it looks like, uh, times 10 to the 19th joules, those last electrons would represent the 2p6 electrons there, which gives us, for those, an azimuthal quantum number of 1, representing those p orbital electrons. So we've now diagrammed on here uh, each of the different uh, principal quantum numbers for our electrons in the spectrum by essentially uh, just walking our way backwards through the Aufbau sequence diagram energy levels. And two additional things I'd like you to note here involving this photoelectron spectrum. Uh, the first has to do with that break along the x-axis um, where we see a big jump in the binding energy of those electrons from it looks like around 65-ish or so uh, times 10 to the of 19th joules uh, per electron there for those 2s electrons, up to way up to 1400 or so times 10 to the of 19th joules for the 1s electrons. And that should make kind of logical sense because what we're seeing right there is a jump in the principal quantum number, a jump in energy level. Uh, what you see there is the difference in energy between the valence shell electrons in that 2s and 2p uh, portion of their spectrum versus the core electrons in the 1s portion of the spectrum. And again, this really tells us why it is so much easier to remove electrons from the outermost valence shell of the atom, and therefore why those valence shell electrons are the ones that tend to be gained and lost uh, while we look at the uh, bonding processes that occur for atoms. 
Uh, the other thing I would like you to note here is that this is a highly simplified diagram of a photoelectron spectrum. Um, in reality, those peaks would not necessarily be all the same uh, height. Um, instead, they would vary based upon a couple different factors. Uh, number one, how many electrons would be present at each energy level. So we might expect to see more electrons from the p orbitals ejected than from the s orbitals because there's just more p orbital electrons overall. Uh, but the second thing that it has to do with is the probability of each of those electrons being ejected. Uh, some electrons, due to their positions and uh, orbits within the atom, might be harder to eject than others, which would lead to a lower peak than others. But in general, when dealing with the AP chemistry test, uh, they simplify these diagrams such that, in general, we would expect to see for most of the diagrams, not all of them they've given us, but for most of them, uh, a higher peak corresponding to more ejected electrons, which kind of lets you make predictions about which are the s versus which are the p orbital electrons. And one last final question involving photoelectron spectroscopy here that we've uh, seen similar to other questions on the AP test. Uh, for our second example here, we've given you two different photoelectron spectra, and we're asking you this time uh, to make a distinction between which of these spectrums represents nitrogen and which one represents oxygen, uh, recognizing that both of these spectrum only show the portion of the spectrum uh, which shows you the peak corresponding to the energy required to remove a 1s electron from each of these atoms. So we're going to want to go ahead now and identify which of these is which and make a justification of our answer. So fundamentally, the only data we have uh, between these two different spectra is the binding energies of those 1s electrons. For the spectrum on the left-hand side there, uh, please make sure to note there that the binding energy is higher on the left end of this uh, scale than on the right. Uh, so we have a binding energy of what looks like to me around 425 times 10 to the 19th joules uh, per electron there. And then for the spectrum on the right, we have a binding energy of somewhere around, looks like maybe 530 or so, 540 times 10 to the 19th joules per electron. So the binding energy of the electron on the right is larger than the binding energy of the electron on the left. And the reason why that would be the case has to do with what it is that's actually binding these electrons to the nucleus, that is the nuclear charge. So really what we are asked here is to distinguish between these two based upon the larger binding energy of the atom correlating to the higher nuclear charge atom. So for the one on the right, because oxygen has more protons in the nucleus than nitrogen, that is a total of eight for oxygen versus seven protons for nitrogen, we can therefore assign the diagram to the right to oxygen with a higher binding energy for its 1s electrons. And the diagram on the left therefore correlates to nitrogen with a lower binding energy for its electrons based upon the difference in nuclear charge between those two different elements. And that's uh, pretty much what we've seen for photoelectron spectroscopy in terms of what the AP test has been asking you to do in recent years. And that concludes this lecture. Thanks for listening.